the second oldest profession, because then you ask me what the <laughs> oldest profession is, and we don't want to go there. Let me give you a few words about the Ministry of Science and Technology. It sees itself as covering the middle ground between pure blue sky research done at universities and uh, the Ministry of Trade and Industry, which supports research in industry. We try to call it directed research, which is still open research, but directed in areas which we are interested in. Recently, the Ministry um, decided on several areas that will be our focus areas. Those of you, the Israelis here, know that the Ministry of Science and Technology has a long name but a very short budget. So we need to, we need to uh, focus on a, f a few things. And the two subjects we decided on, and both are related to optical engineering, are advanced computer science and advanced computation, and advanced hardware, which obviously fits in here. And the other area is marine sciences. And marine sciences, I myself am an aerospace engineer, as I mentioned, and I've been using satellites and optics from satellites for a long time to measure ocean height, ocean temperature, ocean color, and so on. So again, the, these subjects would fit in here. And I'm, not, I'm saying that mainly because we are setting up advisory boards in all these areas, and I'm looking for volunteers. So anyone who's interested, please contact me after the meeting. Uh, also, as you may know, uh, the space, Israel Space Agency is part of our ministry, CELA, and as such, I think has been one of the main clients of ELOP, which you mentioned now, and is selling satellites and satellite, uh, satellite optical equipment and looking around to see uh, faces from that area, to essentially all over all the satellites we, we are building here. Uh, I'll cut short a little because I know we are late and this is the part of the meeting which you have to suffer to get to the real stuff. So uh, I'll only mention one thing out of my area of research, with, which is robotics and has to do with vision. One of the problems we have, and scientists and engineers do not consider enough, is the social effect of our work. You know, uh, those of you who are graduates of Technion may have heard the story of the, about the pipe of blood that was given as an exercise for engineers in fluid mechanics. They were ordered to calculate how, uh, how strong a pump has to be to pump thousands of liters of blood from one place to the other. And what the professor wanted was not the answer. He wanted someone to ask him, where did this problem come from? No one in the class asked. They all calculated it. So we need to go back to look at the social aspects of our work, and here I'd like to raise a point which came up recently, and that has to do with your area. Uh, when we have robots that interact with humans, both in industry and in the home, for example, uh, one of the points of uh, contact is, and you are looking at me and I'm looking at you, it's eye to eye, it's vision and it's optics. Now the problem is how to design eyes for robots that will see well and still look friendly. Because the best eye I could think of designing for a robot would be a simple eye just like the fly has. But can you imagine a robot man-sized with eyes looking like flies' eyes? No one would want that in his home or anywhere else. So what we need to do is design eyes that are good from your point of view, but also good to work with uh, civilians, let's call them. People who need that. For example, robotics we are talking about nowadays are to assist infirm and old people instead of hospital nurses and so on. These would need kind eyes. On the other hand, you may want a stern teacher robot with eyes that say you were not good. So this is a problem I'm raising to you, how to design eyes that look what we want them to look like and still do what, we, what you guys know how to do is how to move the optics. Um, when I started teaching at Technion, I was told three things, to do th three things when you're lecturing. The first is stand up straight so everyone sees you. The second is speak up loud, everyone hears you. The third is to be short so everyone will love you. So with that, I want to thank you all and wish you a very successful meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much. And and, uh,
You can give it to Professor Hench, I'll speak only for two minutes. So Theodor Hench is the director of the Max Planck Institute for Quantum Optics and a professor of experimental physics and laser spectroscopy at the Ludwig Maximilian University in München. Uh, professor Hench has been interested for decades in laser-based precision spectroscopy and the development of new devices and new methods in this field. He and his co-workers developed a new method to measure the frequency of laser light to an extremely higher precision using a device called optical frequency comb generator. Uh, this is a generator of a light spectrum which is made of hundreds of thousands of sharp spectral lines with a constant frequency interval, uh, similar to a ruler. When the frequency of a particular uh, laser line has to be determined, it can be compared to the extremely accurate uh, comb. And one uh, that is fun to fit is the laser frequency that you're looking for. Uh, the invention has been used to carry out very, very uh, precise measurement. And for these achievements, uh, Professor Hench received the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2005. And today, Professor Hench will tell us what we can do with laser frequency comps. Thank you. Uh, it's an uh, honor for me to be the opening speaker at this meeting. And my introduction, uh, you have already heard. Uh, but uh, so what can we do with laser frequency comps? Maybe let me step back a bit. Uh, let's th think about lasers and how they have re revolutionized science and technology. And one uh, way to judge that is to look at the number of Nobel Prizes that have been given around the laser, uh, starting with the first one to Towns, Basov and Prokhorov for masers and lasers, Gabor for holography, Bloomberg and, and Charlotte for laser spectroscopy, Chu, Cointelucci and Phillips for laser cooling, Zavale for femtochemistry, Cornell, Ketele, uh, and Wyman for Bose-Einstein condensation, and in 2005, Glauber, Hall, and myself were Chen Hall, and I shared the prize for work on precision laser spectroscopy, including the frequency comb technique. The Okay. okay. Uh, I, I, I need to stand so that I can see my screen because I cannot <laughs> <laughs> see this. Uh, yeah. So see, the optical frequency comb was conceived as a tool to measure the frequency of light, to count the ripples of a light wave at 100 or maybe 1,000 terahertz. Uh, it can provide a phase coherent link between the optical regime and the radio frequency re region. And it is a viable clockwork mechanism for optical atomic clocks. Uh, the idea that you should measure the frequency of light rather than the wavelengths is old. Art Schorler had good advice to his students and co workers uh, that you should never measure anything but frequency if you want to measure something accurately because measuring a frequency, essentially counting the number of cycles per second, is a digital procedure that is immune to many kinds of noise. But uh, measuring the frequency of laser light remained a dream for a long time. It started with early experiments by Ali Jawan at uh, Bell Labs and later MIT who took two helium neon lasers, superimposed them on the beam splitter, and he could observe a beat note, which indicated that laser light is really classical light. It must have a well-defined uh, amplitude and phase, and it should be possible to count the wiggles of such a light wave. But counting the frequency of light remained a formidable task until the late 1990s. A handful of government laboratories had built up very complex harmonic laser frequency chains to accomplish this task. And uh, here is an example of uh, a chain that has been built 
die Physikalisch-Technische Bundesanstalt in Braunschweig, 